In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is again from John, who, who is circuitous and goes in a spiral, and people throw up their hands and say, oh, John, who gets John? But it doesn't matter if you don't um, appreciate him, and if he doesn't feed what you need to learn about God, if that doesn't matter. I think it's important to at least understand where he's coming from, even if he, if John doesn't isn't one who um, helps you understand your own union with God. So I think it's important uh, that we look at this in those specific ways. So uh, after I go through the sections of this gospel pericope, what I'd like to do is um, uh, help you understand this particular spiral, which is very, very powerful. It starts and ends with keeping commandments, which at first glance might be off-putting because you think, oh, legalism, you know, and, and that doesn't help me at all, and it's all what you can and can't do. But I hope to unpack that in a way that helps you appreciate it in a new way. So it starts and ends with, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the two things that I need you to, to connect in that are love <laughs> and commandments because they are interwoven. Okay, so um, the next thing that's highlighted says another advocate because Jesus himself is the first advocate. So um, that's why Jesus uses uh, the word another. But advocate is a very, very interesting word. This particular translation uh, chooses to use the word advocate, but um, uh, paraclete is often used. In blue or purple there, you've got the Greek word parakleton, which is how you, that's the transliteration. Parakleton is how you say the Greek letters underneath the blue word. And remember, this New Testament was written in Greek. So if you read an original transcription of John's gospel, you would be seeing the Greek letters that you see under the blue, and we would be pronouncing it parakleton. Now, how we translate that into English, I've given a list under that. So it's often translated paraclete, actually probably most often. Our, our uh, new American Bible is using advocate. It's also comforter, also counselor, also companion. So it, it's all of these words are trying to give a shape to what that original word parakleta means. Now here's something that's kind of interesting. There is a dialect in both Cameroon and the Central African Republic, which is called Kare, C-K-A-R-R-E -R -E or K-A-R-E. It's still, it's still spoken today. That's like to the east of Nigeria, Cameroon and then the Central African Republic. It's one of many dialects, but part of the work of people who want to uh, shape baptized Christians is to translate the scriptures into the language of the people. Just like for us, English is, uh, and poor John Wycliffe and others were executed for their original attempts to do that so that we could have something other than Greek or Latin or Hebrew that we could use. So there was um, a person who was in um, the Central African Republic who wanted to translate this. And, and wasn't, got to this section, and he didn't know exactly what to do with parakleton. The people, in my opinion, the people who do this translating the best are the people who know the original language because they can give the flavor more of each word and work at trying to, to um, write down the power of what the original word really meant. So this person couldn't get how to translate what we're calling paraclete or advocate until one day he watched a group of people, this would happen often, when a group of men went into the bush, they all carried loads of things on their head, except for one. And the man who was observed, one man I'm talking about, and the man who was observing that thought, well, he must be the boss or the leader. And, and he kept watching and he kept watching and that, what, that wasn't the case. The guy wasn't the leader. And as, these, as these men got farther and farther into the bush and they have these uh, loads on their head, 
inevitably one would become exhausted and just go to the ground. Then the guy with nothing on his head would come and take that guy's load, put it on his head. That guy could come up and recover and they'd all keep walking until somebody else fell down. And then the guy with no, no load on his head would come and take that guy's place. And that's how they would um, move into the bush. And then the translator knew what he wanted to do with this Greek word parakleta. In the Kari language, the guy with nothing on his head was called the one who falls down beside us. And that's what was used for paraclete. In other words, paraclete that we, we think of as spirit, the Holy Spirit, and rightly, but how do you, how do you um, flesh out exactly what that means? Well, so for the people who speak Kare in Cameroon and Central African Republic, to use that word, the one who falls down beside us, instantly gives them an image which only enriches how they receive this message of the gospel. This is a hugely important story because ideally this goes on in every language all over the world. And for us to understand how another group of people receives this can only broaden and deepen how we receive it. So by understanding what I just told you today, we can begin to have like an, another, ah, another level layer of understanding spirit as the one who takes up our burdens when we can no longer do it ourselves. I think that's so lovely. Um, Hesburgh, who was a very, 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 very long president of Notre Dame, said something that I really liked. He said, I don't care what happens to me, my favorite prayer is come Holy Spirit. If it's good, it's a great prayer. If it's bad, if something bad or I'm going through something terrible, it's a great prayer too. I've thought of that. I, I often will go back to that, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. And in bad times, to think of this in the Kari language is even more profound, I think. And the uh, next word that I highlighted was world. This is something that's particular, peculiar, and specific to John. When John uses the word world, it's hard to say word world together, but when John uses the word world, he means this, anything that is opposed to God. So it's very negative, right? We would say it's a pejorative term. In John's language, the word world is a negative, has a negative connotation. Anything that stands against God. Okay, so when you read, when you hear it on Sunday, then you need to, um, you need to remember what I'm saying to you now. There's a couple things in here. Uh, one is what I underlined. There is um, a lot of this kind of parallelism like thesis, antithesis, you know, in, uh, 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 so what's underlined? I will not leave, I will come. No longer see, you will see. Not leave, come, no longer see, will see. See, that, that's, that's part of John's um, linguistics, I'll say, as well. But look what Jesus is saying. I won't leave, I'll come. The world won't see me, but you will see me. The point of all of this, is that he will be present, Jesus Christ will be present. Which then brings, I have to back up the truck a little more, uh, connecting this to the line that is directly above it. You know the spirit of truth, but you know him because he remains it with you and will be in you. Um, you know him, the spirit of truth, because he remains, remains with you and will be in you. The whole point, the whole promise, the whole goal, the whole message of any religion is this indwelling, what Julian of Norwich talked about as wanting, O-N-E, wanting, this um, belonging, this being part of, I've used the word participatory before, what, what is the life of the Trinity, which is all communion, 
to which life we are invited, that's why we will understand when the world can't. Because anything that stands against God doesn't even pay any attention. Pay any attention. That's going to be important in a couple of minutes. Pay any attention to this indwelling of the divine, this divine being in which we live and move and have our being. Look what it says after the purple. I live and you will live. And then look what it says in the yellow past that. I am in the Father. You are in me. I am in you. That's what makes people throw up their hands about John. Oh my God, all this circular stuff. And he just keeps saying the same thing. Well, first of all, if we could receive what the same thing was, how could we ever get tired of hearing that? You belong to God, not in a way that is connecting an appendage. You belong to the, we, all of the you's, we belong to the heart and being and life of God. We share Trinitarian life. Whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. Um, okay, can I go, before I go to John Spiral, it says, on that day you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Okay, the beginning of that sentence is on that day. Um, people who first heard that thought of what we call um, parousia now, or the day when Jesus will come again in glory, the end of the world, the apocalyptic day when there'll be fire, and people would, would hear that or read that and think of that. But this is the gift of John. He's not talking about something down the track. He, he is talking about um, the dwelling, the indwelling that exists now that comes with the realization of the truth. That's why the paraclete or the advocate is called the spirit of truth. What's true is who we are. And when we realize it, pow, that's the day. So, so then we go to the blue part again. Whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. Okay, first let me talk about the spiral of John and then let me talk about the connection between obeying commandments and love. Okay, so we start with Jesus talking about commandments, and then Jesus promises an advocate, a paraclete, and then the paraclete comes, the promise comes. Look what it says in blue. I will come. Okay, so we've got talk of commandments, then a promise of a paraclete, and then boom, I will come. And then down to the yellow, we are in one another, and that's the truth. And then we're back to the blue, whoever has my commandments and observes them is the one who loves me. Loves me. So John spirals down only so that we deeply, profoundly receive the gift that this is. Now, let me talk about the connection between uh, loving and commandment. First of all, if I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in, in you and people that kind of go, oh, blah, 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 when they talk about John, if, if that is the relationship of mutual love, well, then there are a couple things we need to remember. It's not me by myself that belongs to this Trinitarian life, because as much as I am rooted in and connected to the, the life of God, the divine, thereby the belonging extends to everybody else. So community is implicit in this, which brings in the need for commandments or how we treat one another. So obeying these commandments is um, the condition of having this mutual love and a life of that. And it's also the proof of it. It's the condition, obeying the commandments is the, con is the condition of my being living in the love of God. And it's also the proof that I do, that I do, that I do. It's also the proof that I do live in the love of God. It's both the condition and the proof which makes this mutual sharing in dwelling community, communion that we're called to even possible. So the circle is complete. I have the commandments. I see why I have the commandments. 
I see what's in me that makes obeying the commandments possible. I obey the commandments. Pop, I'm back at the beginning. The commandments were given because of love, and I belong to that circle of love. Okay, now that brings me to the most difficult but most important point of, um, of this particular, well, this isn't the only one, but this particular reading that, that we're going to hear. And that is that this love and forgiveness more than any other moral issue is the keystone and litmus test for Christian discipleship. And that's where I think we have the trouble. The core doctrine more than any other moral issue is how do we live in the love that defines us, that is divine, and that cannot exclude anybody? So therefore, do you see what the, the, the bottom point is? How do you treat those who hate you? How do you treat those you hate? Strong word, but I could use dislike, but, and that's true too, but it's also hate. What do you do in that situation? That's the litmus test of being a Christian disciple. You could believe in Fatima, you could, you could give intellectual assent to the doctrine of the Trinity, all of that. But the litmus test of being a Christian disciple is what do you do with this divine love that you belong to, specifically when it isn't easy for people you hate, for people that hate you. That's the litmus test. And that is huge, and you can't run away from that. And that takes a whole lifetime, a whole lifetime of trying to focus on the divinity we belong to to give us the strength to live out of the truth of that, which is why the spirit is important and specific to this gospel reading. I, I want to tell you a story, and I think this is a story because I couldn't prove if this were true or not. But nevertheless, it's great, I think, for helping us to understand um, kind of the role of the spirit in a way that maybe we haven't used a lot. So in the, 19, in the early 1900s, transatlantic travel, especially luxury transatlantic travel, was um, it offered great job opportunities. People, that was a job people would want because you'd you could travel on a luxury liner between Europe and the United States. But you had to understand if you were going to, um, for instance, be a radio operator um, on one of those ships, you'd have to first understand the very primitive radio system that was used. And you'd also have to understand Morse code because that's how the transmissions were given. Okay, so this, this is, and this could be just a story, but it nevertheless, if it isn't true, it serves my purpose. So they, uh, a ship was interviewing for a radio operator for one of these luxury ships. And they were gathering people in an, a, like a lobby anteroom area to a private office where the commander of the ship, I don't even know if you say admiral, whoever is the, oh, I would say, whoever runs the ship. Anyway, so he, uh, he would be interviewing these guys. And so, and, and they were all men. So they'd, they'd be coming in and they'd sign the paper and they'd sit around and wait. And there was like a message going across over the PA system. And the guys were kind of talking loud so that they could be heard over this PA system saying, just please be seated and all this. And then all of a sudden, one guy furrowed his brow and he got up and he went into the office and he came out with the job. And when people asked him, how come they didn't hear anything, he said, I heard around this repeated announcement of please be seated and you know uh, we will get to you shortly. In Morse code, there was a message, we want to hire a person who is always alert. If you hear this message, come to the private office right away. He's the only one that heard underneath all that, the Morse code went in and got the, got the job. Now that, story illustrates my point because if you can project that kind of a way of thinking to the presence of the spirit in our lives it all comes down to attention but the spirit is always always 
in us, with us, around us, among, there's an important one, among us, because it's not just individual, trying to point out um, where indications, presence, love, life of God is. But we don't pay attention to it. And that's, this kind of piggybacks on what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks. Somehow, we have to move inward and on a regular basis and protect that part of us in which we can tune in to this mutual indwelling, shared life, standing in the divine so that we can live out of it. But we can't pay attention unless we practice paying attention. Attention. And when you practice paying attention long enough, you start to see it's not so much where God is not anymore. Then it's more like, look, 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 because all around us and within us and among, 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 among us is God. And that's the role of the spirit um, within us. Now, the reason I even I took this gospel to this point is something that you need to know about um, certainly Jews in first century Palestine. They were very clannish in a very unique way. I, I don't think this is particular to them and probably exists in, in other cultures uh, to this day, but you owe your allegiance only to the people in your extended family. Now this includes cousins, aunts, uncles, you know, so it's, that's why I use the word clan. It's a, it's a clan, it's big. It's not just your parents and your siblings. But you only owed um, your allegiance to them. They were very conflict prone. And you'd fight because this whole culture was honor driven. You did nothing that would dishonor you in, uh, for somebody in your clan, but you would to somebody from another clan. So, um, it was very typical uh, because one of the ways in which you would honor your clan would be to lie so that you could preserve your honor. So deception and secrecy and lying were a big part of the culture. And uh, because the, what was most important to this honor-driven culture was the honor of this extended group of people to which you belonged, which I'm calling a clan. So you would be deceptive and it wouldn't even be considered wrong if you did that to someone in another clan because what was most important was your clan. So this whole cultural orientation, do you see how they would not know what to do with Jesus' message to love one another? Because they, well, no. Yes, if they're in my clan, but no, not if they're in another clan. But yet, the, like I said, this is a non-negotiable. Loving uh, our neighbor as ourselves, that means in, in first century Palestine, that meant love somebody in another clan the way you love people in your clan. Well, no, that didn't go down. But that's exactly what Jesus meant. And that's why we have to take we have to take it and apply it to how we are now. So maybe we don't live in, although certainly there are, I would say gangs often live like that, right? But, but what's in, the way we can take what the message is and use it for us, I think in a very powerful way is to use the word hate. What do you do with people that hate you? What do you do with people that you hate? Jesus is saying, well, this really isn't a non-negotiable thing. You have to love them. Now, we could argue semantics. Well, I, can, I have to love them, but I don't have to like them and all that. We, we could go on that vector forever and ever and ever. But the truth, we know what the truth is. So, but seriously, in a practical way then, what do you do with it? Uh, one, I'll say exercise, because it really isn't a prayer, that, that um, both Tibetan Buddhists and Zen Buddhists use is, is a way to start with yourself and focus in on the shared, the divine indwelling in you, and then step 
um, move farther and farther away from you to other people. And they do it in a very specific way. So uh, for instance, um, the Zen Buddhists will do, the Zen Buddhist will say, after you quiet yourself, may I be free from fear. May I be free from suffering. May I be happy. May I be filled with loving kindness. And then you take a person that is a friend or whom you love. So like I, I could, will say my brother John, I'll say, may John be free from fear. May John be free from suffering. May John be happy. May John be filled with loving kindness. So you see how first you acknowledge the truth about you and then the next step is somebody that you love. So that's possible, that's doable. But then you move to somebody that either hates you or that you hate, or you could even do the dislike before, or somebody you feel neutral about, and then somebody you dislike, and then somebody you hate, and you say the same prayers. So for instance, um, I'll just say X. May X be free from fear. May X be free from suffering. May X be happy. May X be filled with loving kindness. Now the Tibetan Buddhists have a similar exercise, I'm calling it an exercise, but it, instead of the um, specific words that the Zen Buddhists use, the Tibetan Buddhists will, it, it all happens like silently in your heart and in your mind, where you first plug in to the divine indwelling, and then you picture it, you image it like a, a flow, and then you expand that flow to include family, friends, people that maybe dislike you or you dislike, and then you, gradually it moves out. Now I'm compressing this. This happens obviously in a, in a rather, certainly faster, uh, slower than this period of prayer time. But that remains, a, that remains a question, something we have to move towards that is problematic, I think, for our whole lives. But we can't run away from interacting with that question because it's a non-negotiable part of our Christian discipleship. This beautiful, exciting acceptance of our divine indwelling can't just stop there. It's how we live in it, and then that's what stretches it out. I have no tricks for how to make this happen because I think it takes a whole lifetime of trying, a whole lifetime of trying to pay attention to the spirit, a whole lifetime of trying to recognize the gift that life is. Um, and the, the real discipline of trying to stay connected to that and trying to live out of it. And then maybe realizing the kare, um, interpretation of paraclete in a way that's maybe helpful as you move forward.